Olá, bem-vindas e bem-vindos. Bom dia a todos. Eu sou Denise Barbosa estamos aqui apresentando esse quarto episódio do McKinsey Talks. É um prazer ter vocês aqui com a gente nesta manhã. No episódio de hoje, a gente vai compartilhar conteúdos relevantes para empresas nesse momento tão complexo, é o que a gente vem fazendo no dia a dia e hoje é mais um dia de excelente discussão. Tenho certeza que vocês vão gostar. Antes de mais nada, estamos em meio a uma grande crise humanitária. Todos nós, como pessoas e como líderes, devemos refletir sobre qual a melhor forma de contribuir para amenizar o sofrimento de indivíduos e da sociedade como um todo, num momento tão difícil como esse que a gente está passando agora. Para contribuir com perspectivas, fatos e análises em meio a essa situação tão delicada, a McKinsey hoje traz informações sobre a mudança de comportamento do consumidor, a gente tem falado sobre isso nos últimos dias, e a nossos convidados de hoje são Kevin Bühler, que é sócio sênior da McKinsey, baseado em Nova York, Alexandre Savaia, sócio sênior da McKinsey em São Paulo, e o Arvin Govindarajan, que é sócio da McKinsey em Boston. Bom dia a todos. Uh, bom dia a todos. Uh, nós vamos conduzir a sessão hoje em inglês, dados os entrevistados. Né? Então, uh, today we'll focus our discussion on how banks are reacting to this crisis. Banks in Brazil uh, suffer a lot during the last month, losing 40% of market value and making several adjustments in operating model, things that they needed to do very quickly. You know? However, the banking sector is a fundamental piece to keep the economy running and to mitigate the negative effects of a, of a broader crisis. Uh, given this relevance, Brazilian authorities are developing a number of initiatives to both protect customers as well as ensure a more stable banking sector. And on top of these initiatives, bank, banks in Brazil may benefit from experience uh, we have seen in other geographies. So there are many of them. When we look abroad, uh, we see banks working on three horizons. First, they secure the now, focus on immediate actions to protect customers and employees. Uh, second, they manage the crisis. So moving from a reactive mode to stabilizing the business model, which at this point we don't know, but could last for several months here. And third, getting prepared for the next normal, changing the business model based on evolving customers' new behaviors. Uh, most banks have already gone through securing the now. Uh, we see that in Brazil. So many, many adjustments in operating model uh, running to, to adjust things. Huh? Uh, Given the situation and the expectations that the crisis mode should last longer, we would like to focus then uh, these learnings from other regions and focus a lot on how banks are managing the crisis, which is our second uh, horizon here. To discuss this challenge, we invited Kevin and Arv, who's, who have been working very closely with clients through the, all this crisis and in different parts of, uh, of the world. So uh, Kevin, uh, let me switch to you. Could you please describe the scenarios that we should encounter going forward? Thanks so much, and thank you for having us. Um, let me uh, briefly describe uh, what we see. Uh, there are two imperatives as uh, we manage through this crisis. Uh, the first is to safeguard our lives, uh, to make sure we suppress the virus as quickly as possible. Um, the second is to um, support the economy. Um, and make sure we safeguard our livelihoods because individuals and businesses are being uh, severely affected um, by the consequences of the shutdowns and other things that are necessary to fight the virus. So we need to both fight the virus and uh, uh, support the economy, but the first job is to fight the virus. Um, let me describe the scenarios on the next page um, that we are uh, looking at. Um, on the vertical axis, the first thing we look at is what is the spread of the virus and what is the effectiveness of the public health response? So in the top of the um, matrix, on the top row, um, what you see is rapid and effective control of the virus. Uh, think of what has occurred in China, Singapore, South Korea, um, uh, Taiwan, uh, in terms of the speed of response. Um, um, And that might involve a two to three month shutdown of some or all of many of the uh, economies that are most affected uh, by the virus. Uh, 
uh, this, the middle row is an effective response, but there's some recurrence of the virus likely regionally. Um, and as a result of the inherent characteristics of the virus, uh, the R naught uh, is high enough that even with moderate social distancing um, in, the, in this scenario, uh, the virus uh, continues uh, for several months. So there might be four to six months of rolling shutdowns in this scenario. Um, and then the bottom row, the most pessimistic of the scenarios, is um, a failure of public health interventions. Uh, this is the scenario that was laid out by Imperial College London, where until you have a vaccine or other measures or herd immunity is acquired, over 12 or 18 months, there are continued uh, challenges um, and an overwhelmed healthcare system. Um, on the horizontal axis, on the right hand side, would be um, the most effective economic policy response. Uh, governments are on the front foot from both the monetary and fiscal policy and the rapid delivery of that stimulus. Um, and there are a few knock-on effects as a result and the economy restarts quickly. The middle column, um, we have a more muted recovery and um, policy responses almost offset the drop in consumer demand. Uh, but not quite, and it takes a while for that to arrive. And on the left-hand side, you have ineffective interventions uh, with a host of knock-on effects um, uh, going, uh, going, going through the economy. Uh, so that gets us to nine different scenarios. We are looking in particular at the top right corner of the matrix, those four shaded scenarios. Uh, we think those are achievable with the right public health and public policy responses. Um, what do those scenarios look like in detail? Uh, we, let me take, give you a quick snapshot on the next page. Um, uh, so this is the uh, virus contained scenario, what was uh, scenario A3 on the previous page, the top row and the center column. Um, in this scenario, uh, we have what I'd call a V-shaped recovery um, with uh, China uh, falling first and recovering first. Um, the U.S., Brazil, Mexico, and the world uh, hitting a trough in Q2, um, and then recovering uh, by the end of the year to previous peak GDP levels, um, uh, or perhaps the first quarter of 2021. Um, we are already, in our view, in a global recession. Um, uh, I think the, in the I think we'll see that um, uh, in terms of official pronouncements. Um, I'll just use the um, second quarter as an example. I think we're gonna have a very rapid decline in GDP in second quarter as consumer demand, which makes up 60 to 70% of most economies, falls significantly. And uh, discretionary consumer spending, which is about 40% of consumer demand, uh, may fall by as much as half if we follow the patterns we've seen in China and Italy, for example. So um, really quite sharp. 8% uh, declines in the level of GDP from 100 to 92, for example, which is an annualized pace of negative 28%. Um, so very sharp uh, fall, and then a reasonably rapid recovery if we get everything else right, right? So uh, GDP drops in the negative two to negative 3% range for the full year, assuming we get the back end of the year correct. Um, let me turn to the next scenario briefly, um, a, a more muted recovery. Here, this is the center box, um, uh, the center square, if you will, of the nine box matrix. Um, and in this more pessimistic scenario, we see a deeper decline and we don't hit a trough until the second half of the uh, 2020 calendar year. And it takes a longer time till 2022 or even 2023 um, uh, for, for recovery to previous peaks. Um, that would be very serious indeed. Um, let me turn to the historical comparison, and I'll use U.S. data here going from 1900 forward. Um, this is a drawdown chart of GDP starting from 100. How bad might this look? If you look at 2008, 2009 and the global financial crisis, peak to trough GDP fell by 4% in the U.S., for example. Um, what we're forecasting is in the second quarter, uh, U.S. GDP could fall by 8% in our V-shaped scenario, and by the third quarter, 13% uh, in our U-shaped scenario. Um, so um, really quite serious, you know, by way of comparison, the Great Depression in 1929 to 1933, we saw 
uh, decline in GDP uh, from 100 to 74, if you will. Uh, so this is uh, quite significant by historical standards. And if you go to the next page, um, this shows the steepness, again, for US data um, of the decline. The black line is the um, V-shaped um, uh, scenario. Uh, the first one I discussed, the virus is contained. Um, in that scenario, uh, we see a decline from 100 to 92 uh, in GDP, uh, or a negative 28% pace of decline. Um, the horizontal blue line is the global financial crisis, again, in the US, which hits a trough in Q6 and returns to previous peaks around Q12 and Q14. Um, you can see uh, this is a much steeper pace of decline. Uh, so we have um, uh, uh, not encountered since World War II, these are all the recessions since World War II, we've not um, uh, uh, seen something this sudden from a world uh, perspective and from the largest economies in the world. Uh, so those are the scenarios we think you need to be prepared for. Oh, very good. And, and, and look, uh, most banks uh, in Brazil, given these expectations, obviously opinions vary and, and banks are trying to understand uh, how this is going to evolve. Huh? But many banks in Brazil have gone through the initial emergency actions maybe in Brazil in the last two to three weeks. Huh? What are the key topics that banks are looking at now? Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, thanks, Alexander. I think essentially what people are thinking about are three kind of large blocks. The first one is ensuring that the business actually survives. The first step in that is to make sure that the internal operating mechanisms, for example, the, uh, uh, the payments methods, the ATMs, et cetera, are all functioning, uh, given that there are large uh, disruptions in uh, what people can do and the technology people have and people getting sick. The second one is the traditional distribution channels, your call centers, your bank branches uh, are quite prone to, for example, uh, uh, spreading disease as well as uh, uh, most prone to operational disruptions such as lockdowns. So de-risking those has become a very, very important step. The third, of course, is shifting to digital because the, uh, it is one channel that is quite clean in terms of, uh, of, of COVID-19 as a result of which they're all trying to do, to do that. The fourth big one is liquidity. As we know, we're likely going to see an increase in the number of uh, customers who will not be able to pay, as a result of which banks may have liquidity uh, problems. And so what they're trying to do is to make sure that they uh, have contingency plans and actions they can take to make sure they have, they have liquidity. Very importantly, they have to also have to fulfill the social responsibilities that banks have in the economy. The first of which is to protect the customers. Customers are going to have problems. They will not be able to pay. Uh, they will have other issues as well. Many of them will have uh, uh, personal health issues they will deal with if they actually catch the disease. So they're thinking through what can they do to help mitigate uh, impact to customers, which broadly speaking will help society. They cannot do this without engaging the government because after all, government help will be needed. And so the more proactive banks are actually engaging on a, a daily or weekly basis with the regulators, with the governments, with the society, so they know what they, their position is uh, to stay safe. In the long term, this uh, may be with us for a while because as Kevin mentioned, there may not be vaccines available to us uh, till sometime next year, which means they have to do two things. What will their uh, balance sheet and what will their income statement look like under such a crisis, under different scenarios? And the second one is what does the new normal look like? Let's say the lockdown ends in, in eight to 12 weeks. People have to come back to work. How do we make sure that the work environment is clean enough, works well enough, so that when people come back, they don't get sick again? So you have to adapt your new operating model as well to the prevalence of a virus that is not fully under control uh, till a vaccine is provided. So thinking through the next phase, what happens when people come back to work is equally as important as uh, the actions people are taking now. No, very, very clear, thanks. Um... One, one point, and given the experience we have seen in other geographies, countries that had this process starting before Brazil, I don't know, a month or two months before, what are the most challenging topics here? What should banks focus on? Huh? Um, a, a few things. 
Uh, one is how to make sure that traditional channels to customers are safe, both for employees and for customers. So how do you make your customers feel comfortable coming into a bank branch? Um, in some of the most affected markets, like in uh, Wuhan, uh, in Lombardy, in Italy, um, they were unable to put cash in red zones, into ATMs. So how do you manage that uh, process? So the physical operations of uh, traditional uh, channels like branches, uh, call centers are another place where we've seen uh, quite significant operation, operational challenges. Um, many of the global call centers um, are not set up for work from home arrangements for the majority of their employees. They don't have the uh, capabilities to do that um, in some places and um, banks have started to obviously relied on those quite heavily. So how do you make sure your uh, call centers and service centers uh, are, are safe um, for your uh, employees and where relevant your customers? Uh, number two is credit. Um, this sudden stop in the economy has put strains on individuals uh, and on their payments of everything from mortgages to credit cards uh, and on businesses. Uh, and on their ability uh, to pay back loans. Um, uh, what's quite important is figuring out what sort of support are banks going to be able to offer to their customers. And again, Italy, uh, many banks uh, voluntarily uh, offer payment holidays on mortgages and other consumer credit processes, and eventually were able to do that without any, you know, uh, adverse treatment of those loans uh, through government support. We were eventually ordered to do that as well. Um, in um, Germany, uh, the government ended up guaranteeing uh, new offers of credit uh, to the Mittelstand, to small businesses, um, uh, in any bank origination of credit um, uh, was uh, bank origination of new credit or drawdowns on existing revolvers uh, were supported by a government guarantee um, to make sure banks were not looking for violations of uh, reps and warrant, representations and warranties or other conditions uh, to prevent loans from flowing. Um, I, I think we're going to see that focus on continued access to credit as being critical to supporting uh, the economy. Uh, and then finally is uh, sustainable remote working. Um, we've, all, you know, uh, rapidly around the world started to rely on Zoom conference calls. Um, and um, the question is, how do you do that not for a week or two, but for an extended period of time? Um, it, when, you, when you're in the second month uh, of uh, this mode of working, how do you support your workforce and make sure that um, that is sustainable uh, uh, for the institution and for the individuals involved? Oh, very good. To, uh, to one of your points, no? uh, Brazil uh, is a country that still heavily uses branch network. We have uh, a large branch network for many banks. No? Uh, what has been the role of the branch network since the crisis started with all this challenging of uh, working in the banking premises versus working at home? Um, so first of all, um, the branches play an important role in the perception of the banks by customers. So making sure that uh, your, the institution seen as um, stable and accessible uh, is, is important. Um, many institutions have found they don't need as many branches as they thought. Um, one CEO that one of my colleagues spoke with um, uh, said, um, You've been telling me for years I could survive with 25% fewer branches. Well, I've just realized that I can survive with 50% fewer branches um, over the past few weeks. Um, so, you know, very different strategies in terms of physical footprint um, and understanding where your customers are, you know, what branch can serve multiple uh, uh, customer sets, um, uh, all that, you know, understanding the geographic layout and the um, uh, radius they can serve, that's all become very important. Um, and then again, the, um, the flow of cash into the economy is quite important. Um, so just making sure that you can have the right level of cash inventory in your branches, in your ATMs, uh, to allow people to get the cash they need 
at these times uh, can be quite important. Um, we saw, just like you saw hoarding of toilet paper and masks uh, and hand sanitizer, um, we saw hoarding of cash. Um, so many people, you know, were withdrawing nine or ten thousand dollars at a time and lining up to do so at branches, um, uh, not because they really needed it, um, but as a precautionary measure. Um, it's important for the banks to anticipate that that sort of behavior may occur. Oh, very, very nice. And and given all the issues we have with the branches, the ones you commented. Uh, call centers, I understand, become even more important during this crisis, right? Uh, as branches uh, are closed or partially closed here. Uh, what have been the main challenges to operate large call center operations in this environment? So there are a number of challenges, I think, in the call center space that people have to think about. Uh, the first one is that you, the call center itself uh, many, uh, is, is a place where many people are in close proximity to each other and the first question is, how can I possibly separate them? The, in some cases, which is uh, rarer, people actually have tried to get to call centers where some of the employees are actually working, working from home. Not generally possible, but it is in some cases. Other banks have actually split their single call center in, into multiple geographical locations, each of them manned by uh, a very uh, considerably fewer people than the, uh, than the original call center. This also means that they have to separate within the call center all of the employees so they're more than a few feet apart uh, for safety reasons. They've also had to increase the cleaning levels of these various uh, uh, call centers. What turns out to be the hardest of all of this is kind of the cultural element. So you can do all the cleaning, you can do all the separation, but you actually need the employees to actually do the right thing in keeping the environment clean because you don't clean every 15 minutes, you clean you know, in, at the end of a shift. Uh, so getting the, the kind of uh, culture to behave in a way that is uh, very COVID-19 friendly has been a, has been a big, uh, important, important step. There are some other complications as well. Coordination. Traditionally in call centers, there's a team manager who looks at the, uh, he can see them, his or her employees. There's a board where the stats are visible, et cetera. When you go distributed, that is no longer as easy to do. So what banks have had to do is adopt other techniques, much more frequent check-ins by phone, uh, uh, check checkups on uh, on things like uh, 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 performance, etc., by uh, by remote login, various methods by which the team uh, lead can check up on the team even when they are when they are widely distributed. The last one is also in terms of uh, uh, how to think about uh, uh, potential disruptions. Given that a call center does have even in distributed world people near each other, preparing for a state where you may lose a significant chunk of your employees in one shot because one person gets COVID-19, making everybody else susceptible. So preparation for when you may lose one of your uh, uh, entire teams or more than one of your teams is a huge part of planning for, for call center action. In the cases where, and, and along the same lines, operationally speaking, you also have to make sure that all of the employees stay compliant. So how, uh, so how do team members check on uh, what uh, their, uh, their call center employees are doing, given that they can't see them and talk to them on, on the same level as they would if they were in there? So banks are adopting many other methods, such as uh, a few kind of remote surveillance, as well as uh, multiple phone calls to get to, uh, to, get to that point. Oh, very good. Uh, look, uh, it is... Uh, Getting close to nine, to be respectful to everyone's agenda, I'll come up with a last question before we open to questions for the audience, right? So would the current risk tools be useful in this, in, in this new normal, given that uh, the situation is completely different from uh, what we have seen and what we have actually used to, to build our risk tools, models, and et cetera? Yeah. What, um... Let me start and maybe Arv, you can comment as well, if that's all right. Um, you know, my, my first observation is that um, banks have for the most part developed the tools they need to understand how to navigate here. Um, you know, for example, stress testing, um, which many saw as an academic or regulatory exercise, is something that boards of directors and senior managers are brushing off quite rapidly. Um, now the scenarios weren't right, I wish, we had had the foresight uh, to tell 
banks to plan for a pandemic scenario of this magnitude, um, but I don't know of many institutions that did so. Um, uh, but they are rapidly um, trying to understand what's the range of scenarios we might encounter, you know, with what depth and severity and for what period of time, and how will that affect us? And I think the tools they've developed over the past decade are turning out to be very useful uh, in terms of communication. Uh, interestingly, the U.S. stress tests are due in six days, uh, five days actually now, um, and um, uh, the um, scenarios there, um, the baseline scenario shows 1.75% GDP growth in 2020. That's extraordinarily unlikely to come to pass. Um, so banks are actually looking at more severe scenarios than what they're submitting um, this coming week um, for their own accounts. And I, I think that's giving people comfort that they understand what may come. I don't know, Arv, if you have some other observations. Yeah, I would also say that some of the other tools become even more important. So for example, banks do line management, banks have pre-delinquency, banks have underwriting models. The key question here is how to use them, the same tools. Pre-delinquency might become much more important now than the collections, because if you can figure out which of your customers are going to be in trouble in the short term, uh, uh, you know, in the next month, you can proactively start to do pre-delinquency actions now. For example, low, uh, payment holidays, for example, offers, knowing that in the long term, they may not pose a, a long-term risk. So separation of the, of the customers into who are just kind of a short-term risk and as soon as the economy comes back, they'll be fine, versus people who are actually risky anyway, that even without COVID-19, they would have a problem. Separating the two becomes much more important than, than, than ever before. Uh, so I would say the same tools, have, uh, the banks have the tools. The question is, which ones do they focus on more and how do they respond to it? Or, and how do they respond to it? And, and finally, I just say that there are some uh, tools that have been put in place for business continuity purposes that turn out to be valuable. So multiple trading floors um, or uh, other backup physical locations turn out to be very valuable. Um, having a central team, typically led by an individual, an individual who's reporting directly to the CEO, um, who's focused on this 100% of the time with multiple different disciplines from operations and technology, um, because uh, scaling up your digital infrastructure turns out to be quite important, managing your cyber exposures when you, lots of people are working from home turns out to be very important. You know, all, all the different disciplines at the institution, your chief financial officer, your business unit leaders, you know, need to understand what's going on and having one central team is important. Uh, some firms are also finding that a nerve center, um, you know, imagine a uh, control room with uh, glass screens with all the data that you need uh, at, at a moment's notice available um, in this rapidly changing environment. Having that sort of nerve center capability uh, is uh, also quite valuable. And some have stood that up um, sometimes for other purposes, but are finding it valuable in this context. Well, very good. Thanks, Kevin. And our, uh, Denise, uh, Let's open for questions from the yeah. audience. Uh, let's open for questions from the yeah. audience. Okay, sure, Savai. I have here a question for Arvin. Uh, several banks are not observing a productivity reduction during this initial phase. Is this sustainable? If not, how so? Some of my clients, as well as across the world, you actually do get some sort of divergence amongst the banks. Some banks continue to not see a, a major productivity decline. And part of what they've done correctly is switch from a, uh, the old normal to the, to the new normal. Essentially why the productivity decline hasn't happened is because people are all in, uh, in uh, crisis mode. People are working hard and harder to get, get everything working. This is not sustainable by itself unless you switch the way you operate into uh, a, a, mo a mentality of, of being remote. For example, changing the way you have meetings having meetings being very efficient in terms of using Zoom and using the chat functions, et cetera, efficiently. The way you run uh, online meetings and the way you run uh, in-person in, uh, in meetings are different. If you do it correctly, you lose little productivity. Uh, uh, if you don't do it correctly, you lose a, you lose a bunch. This is especially true with, uh, with things like call centers, et cetera. I have here a question for Kevin now. What's different in this crisis compared to previous one? Should our traditional weapons work? Should our traditional weapons work? 
Um, there are a couple of things that are different in this crisis. Um, the first is the central banks are moving very quickly um, in order to provide liquidity to the system. Uh, I'll use the US, which I know best, um, but the Fed has gotten an A plus uh, in terms of their actions to date, um, uh, both in their interest rate moves, but also in the alphabet soup of liquidity uh, and, and support programs that have been rolled out. So everything they learned uh, 12 years ago, they've now uh, implemented very, very rapidly. So um, I think, I hope liquidity is less of an issue. We see a lot of large corporations preemptively drawing on their lines of credit, uh, especially in the most effective industries like airlines and aerospace, oil and gas. Um, I think that's a natural move if you're a chief financial officer. I think the bank should be able to um, have the uh, liquidity uh, and, and capital strength as well to support that. Um, I think the second thing is banks are stronger. Um, we, we've spent a decade building up capital and liquidity buffers, and those are, you know, this is the sort of time that those buffers are meant for. Um, so uh, we think you have a much stronger banking system, which will um, be a uh, positive influence on the course of the crisis. Um, uh, we do have, I'll, I'll use Europe as an example, you know, near zero interest rates already. Uh, so it's harder to move on that policy lever there, although uh, the ECB and others uh, are, are using their balance sheets uh, quite aggressively. Um, but that's a difference, uh, probably a negative difference in terms of starting point, uh, in terms of degrees of flexibility. Um, I'd also say the nature of the shock here is different. Um, last time you had what I would call a traditional financial crisis and a demand side shock. Now um, you have a supply shock as well. Uh, you don't you don't have uh, you have a demand shock in terms of reduced consumer demand, but you also have a supply shock as global supply chains reconfigure. And if you relied on China as your producer in the first quarter uh, of the year, well, you probably decided to consider what domestic production looks like. Um, uh, you know, there's um, many, many aircrafts and cruise ships and factories um, that have been taken offline for some period of time. That productive capacity has been stripped from the economy. So that's a little bit different uh, than last time. And um, supply shocks, um, economists will tell you, are a little bit harder to manage through uh, and uh, to recover from. So I think we'll find that uh, to be uh, more of a challenge even in the Keynesian world. I mean, our time is almost up, but I'd like a few more words from you. Uh, as economies are starting to get back on track in Asia, what are the early indicators for banks in that part of the world? Um, you know, so I would say um, uh, the banks in Asia are instructive uh, for a few reasons. Um, first of all, um, they've been at the forefront in, draw, in dealing with changed customer behavior. So in China, um, they found that their customers early in the crisis were spending seven hours a day online and went to nine hours a day online. So they rapidly, the Chinese banks, rapidly accelerated their digital strategy um, and you know, found that being able to communicate with their customers from a marketing perspective, from a customer uh, service perspective, in a fully digital mode was a critical differentiator. Um, so I think the first thing that, you know, Asian banks um, and Italian banks uh, and, and other highly effective economies are seeing is that digital is here to stay, right? And what had been a three-year digital plan is becoming a three-month digital plan for many institutions. This is an imperative uh, to serve your customers effectively. Um, you know, number two, um, efficiency is important. Um, I think... There's an interesting trade-off here. Uh, I would say um, this is a very difficult time for banks to impose very harsh productivity measures. Um, I think this is a time when banks need to show solidarity with their customers and their employees, but they need to have a plan in place uh, for what the future is. And I think with the rise in digital capability, you'll find a very different uh, workforce 
uh, going forward in many institutions than you have today. I hope that's after the depths of the crisis. I think the next two or three months, um, you know, uh, as we're go going through rolling lockdowns, as we're fighting the virus, um, you know, we need to have um, a much more collaborative uh, environment for firms, their customers, and their employees. Um, but getting to the right efficiency ratio, uh, the right workforce, you know, which will probably mean, you know, um, fewer employees, uh, but perhaps uh, more talent of certain types. You know, you may need more digital and analytic talent, for example, to operate uh, in this in this future world. So where do you source that talent? How do you compete with the other folks who are looking for precisely that uh, set of individuals in the long term? And the last thing I'd say is that we're seeing is the trust you establish with your customers at this time is going to shape your relationships with them for the next decade. I think this is a moment of truth for the banking industry. This is a moment of truth for our societies and making sure that we have true leadership that's taking the right actions um, in this environment is what customers will remember. And there's an opportunity uh, to distinguish yourself and contribute to society at the same time. And I think that's really the imperative right now. Yeah, you're right. Thank you very much, Kevin, for your words. Uh, thank you, Arvin, too, and Alexandre Tavaia. Muito obrigada a todos vocês pela ótima discussão e os aprendizados divididos hoje. Nesse cenário desafiador, será muito interessante acompanhar os efeitos dessas ações de resposta com o mercado vai se posicionar. Eu queria agradecer a todos vocês que passaram os últimos 45 minutos com a gente. Amanhã, em nosso quarto episódio, a gente vai falar sobre o impacto da crise no e-commerce e no marketing digital no Brasil. Eu vou ter aqui como convidado o Thiago Flores, que é CEO do Zoom e do Buscapé, é, o Marcelo Tripoli, que é sócio associado da McKinsey em São Paulo, e a Joana Carluxo, que é sócia da McKinsey também aqui em São Paulo. Para conhecer a nossa agenda completa do McKinsey Talks, acesse www.mckinseytalks.com. Lá vocês podem assistir a todos os episódios anteriores. Amanhã vai estar esse de hoje disponível lá e vocês também encontram acesso para as versões em áudio disponíveis em Spotify e que a gente também vai colocar a discussão de hoje é, a, também no Spotify disponível para vocês. Queria agradecer de novo. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Até amanhã, gente.